And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Two of them, actually. The double-headed monster coming to us straight from Dead Tree Studios, creators of the upcoming ga upcoming Monster Girl-themed game, Dames of Astoria, that's with two S's. <sighs> ah, the d once we have the we have both ends of Dead Tree, Stu Dead Tree Studios tonight. How are you two doing? Hello, I'm Zen Harmonix. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, L9OBL. Uh, thank you for having us on. Uh, I guess to answer your question, and unlike Zen over here, <laughs> um, <I'm panicked. laughs> I'm I'm doing pretty okay, all things considered. Can't complain. No one listened to me, anyways. <laughs> what about yourself? I am do I am doing good. It is n it is my ideal kind of weather right now, which is n which is any t any time it's not sunny, um, and. I, and um, I did, and I was, and I haven't had to deal with any um, road construction tomfoolery because there are only two seasons where I come from: winter and construction. Oh, you live in uh, Ontario as well? <laughs> no, you're not far off though. I'm in Minnesota. <laughs>, Laughs in sudden. <laughs> um. You know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that, and I'll grant that in a bit. You'll have, you'll have a lot more, t you'll have a lot more opportunities to laugh and laugh in Southern in a few months when I have to deal with the August heat, or as, as it's known around here, the dog days, because you may as well sweat like one. And I'll, pro uh, at least for, at least for some of the people in Texas who laugh at, who laugh at me whenever I have to deal with summer. I'll just re I'll just remind them I'll just remind everybody in the South how one inch of snow is enough to make people panic and start playing the theme of the Wicked Witch of the West. I know, right? It's funny. Oh. Yes, it's a horrible tragedy. But I mean, it, I mean, I feel I feel bad for the people who got really screwed up during that winter storm, but at the same time, my um, asshole side of myself. Rem remembers all the times when when I when I've had su when I've had Southern folks um, laugh at me over my poor response to to um, excess heat. So I like to consider it a kind of balancing the equation thing. Ah, uh, yes, the cosmic karma. Mm-hmm. So a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk walk me through your respective first um experience with role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh no, you wanna start? Uh, and um well uh I played a little like D and D three point five in like high school esque days. Um didn't really stick all that much. Um you know, played a campaign or two enough to get familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just kind of, you know, group fell apart and never really bothered to pick it up. And then, uh, a couple years later, back in 2014, uh, met a couple of assholes, uh, one of them called Biscuit, uh, well, primarily Biscuit, and he introduced me to Zen and Moon and the rest of Dead Tree, and, uh, they were making this, this game called Fallout Equestria, um, just uh, working on it and playing the ever living hell out of it, and I was very big in the Fallout Equestria at the time, and mm. so Biscuit was like, "Yeah, why don't you come join and uh, play?" And I played, and I got hooked, and unfortunately, I have not been able to escape any of these fuckboys uh, ever <laughs> since. Um, <laughs> also, uh, sorry, I I unfortunately have a bit of a bad habit of swearing. It's uh, if that's an issue, I can uh, absolutely. A, it is absolutely not an issue, and okay. the, and I have I Fucking have heard good. far I have heard far 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 worse. I can so yeah. You. 
Um, long story short, um, got introduced to a uh, D10 roll under system called Fallout Equestria in the uh, post-apocalyptic world of Equestria. Uh, you can think of the game being a uh, place a little similar to Dark Heresy and is uh, Fallout but with magic um, and pastel colored horses and uh, unfortunately got kind of trapped into the whole thing. And then... Uh, all of us kind of decided that, you know, since we were making this, what was essentially just a massive insane homebrew uh, that just spun off into its own game system, we decided to properly make that, and, uh, well, now here we are. Mm -hmm. Now, when, now, um, when it came to, now going for, going from something like that, the, um, what you what you described as a ho a insane homebrew, which um, I'll state for the record, um, homebrew that goes that goes off in a completely crazy direction, you're in good company when it comes to that. <laughs> um, but I mean, you'll I'm, have to talk to Zen a little bit more because yeah. it was his system. <laughs> yeah, before before I get before I get into Dames proper, when it came to fall when it came to Fallout Equestria, was it a case of just just um. Zen, you try you trying you trying to answer what if we, what if we what if we mixed x and y or how how did it how did it come about uh that actually ties up into my story how i got into tabletop gaming mm -hmm. uh let me start there so when i was interested in tabletop gaming like dungeons and dragons i always seen in like uh cartoons tv shows some type of pop culture they usually make a reference to it or in some way shape or form mm -hmm. either D D or maybe at the time, it was like a World of Warcraft or any type of game like that, mm -hmm. right? MMOs. Now, in the, in my lack of people who are interested in the same things as I was, and being poor, I didn't have any of this ability to actually you know use it. But I always like the the fantasy, the exploring worlds and the magic and things, right? So once I finally got to about uh, college. Uh, well, 12th grade college. Uh, I started actually looking online. I was like, hey, can I play some games? Like, see if I, what finally is some of these things I can get into. But unfortunately, I didn't have no money for, you know, D&D. &D, and I didn't ha know of any of the resources that are actually free online, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, I was also going through, like, uh, a really high, like, Fallout addiction. I just loved it so much. And I said, you know what, let's see if there's any, like, roleplay forms for, like, uh, Fallout. And eventually I found Fallout Equestria through that. Mm -hmm. And doing so, I got to the point where I actually started a game. I well, not started a game, but I, I got into a game from someone else. And I didn't... I couldn't quite gra grasp it, you know? It was learning a tabletop system when you, like, was never really introduced it in any type of way it, it was a bit jarring for me so i decided you know if i'm going to do anything to learn how to play the system of fallout equestria i'm going to run one myself so the complete newbie who did not gm a day in his life who only started role playing a week after quite literally he just got into like a, any type of role playing game decided to gm a game himself and from there i kept going right mm -hmm. just just straight off the rails uh i liked it though so i like jamming and eventually once i found this you know system for the equestria it was unfinished it's very it, it worked i'm not gonna lie yeah it, it worked it had like the basis of uh, dark heresy as l9 said before and everything you know was good but i felt like it could be better Especially since the community at the time was so supportive of it. Like, it had its own form and everything. It's still up, but, you know, it's pretty much dead now. But it's still up. And you can, you know, you could, you know, just add anything to it. I was like, okay, I'll take this, I'll take this, and I'll, I'll start my running of my own game. Had, had my own party for like a whole year. Uh, DMing and GMing, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So when it got to the point where... Uh, about like I want to say maybe a year in, I said to myself like, you know, this is good, but I'm waiting for these uh these people to you know add something new or whatever to the game. Why don't I just do it? 
why don't I just like fix the problems that I see in the system or whatever? So I started doing that. And this is around the time I met L9. He was in another game with him by running by, running by a friend of ours. Uh, and as the games keep playing, we always find something new, you know, that's wrong with the game. So I said, okay, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. I'll, oh, that's cool. I'll add that. I'll add that. I'll add that. So eventually it got to the point where uh, some of it got online. Uh, probably focus on me, but you know, some of it got online. People started using it. I was like, "Oh, that's cool. I don't care." And you know, and it started to get like some type of popularity. And you know, it was still being like a uh, homebrew mishmash. It's like very unbalanced, you know. But uh, eventually, we got to a point where it says, "Hey, yo, a lot of people like it. If we like it, why don't we just get like uh, scrounge up some money?" So mm-hmm. we can get it for ourselves, like get a like a printout, like an actual printout, so we don't have to like keep going on uh, like our computers when we go out like to get off a con or something, right? Uh, so we said, hey, yo, know, we we'll get that, and but you know if we're going to go for all this trouble of you know formatting into a book, which was a much more difficult process than I originally thought, why don't we just like sell it to the masses, see if anyone else wants it? And, you know, it worked out. And so, as we sold that, uh, we got enough capital to start our own IP, which is Dame's Last Story, which we're here to discuss today. Mm-hmm. Now, that does, br- that does bring me to, da- to Dame's of Astoria proper. Now, first, now, um, you guys you guys are going from what was essentially e- essentially Equestria meets Fallout to... A, to a essentially a monster girl um, fantasy series, um, and obviously I, I'm fairly I've been fairly familiar with with monster girls in one in one form or another. I'm I'm on the internet, <laughs> <laughs> and and what I'm curious about is how did how did you first find out about this per- this particular kind of niche, and what made you, what made you choose that as the direction to go for something like dames. Well, I want to first put out the caveat that we are complete degenerates. Yes. We are weebs to the extreme. Um, we're not the cringy, you know, katana-wielding, you know, lady. Oh, oh. oh, no milady, okay. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I have a katana that killed a rat, so, you know. <laughs> that is My true. My katana at least drew blood. <laughs> that is right. I forgot about that. You have that... that the katana that's now on your mantle that you I got use. the rat slayer and t- and the tetanus blade. <laughs> yeah, I totally forgot about that. Uh, Look, you're, am- uh, you're among good. Co- as far as being degenerates and weebs, you're among good company. Yeah. Um. So I mean, that was really. I mean, at the time, kind of when we were starting to to look past Fallout Equestria and. Um, you know, which, uh, I, I mean, we all love to death, uh, but is kind of a, a mix of different IPs we don't own, so it's, you know, gotta kind of stay at arm's length, the, uh, the more legit we go. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, as we were kind of looking past that for our, like, our own IP, we had a whole whack of different games, or at least game ideas planned, um, to make different IPs, um, there's the Monster Girl one, um, which we were just calling Monster Girl Quest as a placeholder name for the longest time because we just didn't have a name for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't want it to actually be like a Monster Girl Quest game. We just you're going on quests as Monster Girls, so you know Monster mm-hmm. Girl Quest bits. Um, and um, there's a Knight's Tale, which was um, not my idea, um, but you could think Hood Knights, and I mean, I'm a white, I'm a pasty white dude, so every time mm-hmm. I talk about that game, I get weird freaking looks. Everyone just looks at me like I'm, like, you know, got three eyes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, y- you remember that meme that was popular a couple years back, where it was like, uh, damn, son, you getting to be, uh, a badass knight, which and you want, and it's like, fire knight, water knight, you know, and they're all, like, <laughs> super kind of hooded out, like, the water knight was just, like, um, you know, uh, 
smart like a science bitch, but not a bitch. Um, you know, uh, get all uh, get all the the bitches properly wet. No, I'm saying, um, you know, uh, always always down for a wet t-shirt contest. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then like negative was you're just a nice person with uh, a water hose. Um, and so they all just have these weird pluses, and it was just like absolute like hood nights and um that was originally uh, our first game that before it, that was what we were thinking of being our first game yeah, yeah. and i still want to make it as uh as crazy as i look every time i talk about it um that and how we like... and how we moved on from that we got it from uh uh we was looking for that niche because we decided like if we're going to be like any type of unique we gotta go for a, a niche audience like we did with Fallout question mm-hmm. right mm-hmm yeah. So we... it's like, what's the next best thing that's like fantasy, uh, but like out there, but not possibly racist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've been we've been cult we we've spent the last five plus years cultivating a relatively dedicated fan base. What was something that we could segue into, which most of our fan base would, um, just have an interest in, um. Uh, or at least, you know, like, enough of, you know, because my little pony in Fallout, most most of the people in our fan base um, are weebs as well, or at least somewhere in the space enough that they'd be willing to check the game out. Um, and, and, like, the what sin was... from the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then, at the same time, like, what was what was something that, that, that could be a niche, that could fill uh, a niche for when we go outwards. Because, like, if we just went with, like, generic sci-fi, well, I mean, name a sci-fi game of cyberpunk and, um, I'm pulling a blank on the D6 base one that's not cyberpunk. Um, Shadowrun, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, if, if we're going a little bit more generic, there's a lot more competition. If we go something a little bit more niche, it, it'll it allow us to break out into a bunch of other different areas. Like, I mean, we're, we're doing fantasy and Monster Girls because we like fantasy and Monster Girls. It allows mm-hmm. us to break into fantasy and, you know, grow our fan base um, and just otherwise be a really cool IP that we can fall in love with that we're going to enjoy. Because that's the other thing, too, is like, you know, as much as like we want to create fun games for our fan base, screw our fan base. You can all fucking die in hell. I want to play. I want to make games that I want to play. Um. <laughs> um. And the answer was clear. Yes. Everyone loves monster boobs. <laughs> monster monster girl titties. You can you can be uh, the big tittied monster girl or small titty. It flatters your justice of your dreams. Um, <laughs> or you could just go on a really cool fantasy adventure because, mm-hmm. like, like it, I don't know, it just, it made sense. Um, yeah. well, if you want to run an off-brand campaign, that's up to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, strangely enough, though, when I was researching, uh, Monster Girls, you know, <clears throat> research, it turns <laughs> out there's not actually not many, like, tabletop games. There's, like, one that I, that's, like, really, like, I I, I think it's popular anyway. The one that I know is of is uh, oh man, heroines of a lost stage. He- heroines of the the first stage was the the first oh, one. The lost yeah. stage I think was the sequel. There but was, the... I remember that there was one of there was one other that I only found out about through TG, and was oh, essentially Fort Shanner, man of culture. Yes, <laughs> was essentially a heavily heavily hacked ass version of the rule set from Warhammer Fantasy just fo- just focused more on monster girls and um specifically a hacked version of Warhammer Fantasy 2nd edition and it was playable but but um navigation on the thing was a bit of a nightmare and the version that I have is the version that I used once or twice, which is heavily modified for the sake of my sanity. So it's not going to be the one that, if you were to dig it up, um, you'd end up finding. Because, well, a bit, of, a bit of a confession that I've made elsewhere, I have never in my life run a game rules as written. Fair enough. I mean, like, that. it's kind of something, when we released our 
Game Master's Guide um, for Fallout Equestria, like, that was actually kind of one of the really big things we said was, like, rule of cool, rule of fun. You are God in this world. Um, the rules are there to help you along, but if there's something that doesn't fit or you don't like, just change it. Like, who actually does a game fully rules as written? I have yet to meet the person. The only, I... ti the only time I've ever seen it is Adventures League and, um... Let's just say that okay. that the people who run Adventures League in my neck of the woods are very. Ver they think they're gods every day that I d that I will never show up again. Mm hmm. But I mean, I'm not gonna say anything like bad about mm -hmm. like Adventures League or like Pathfinder Society or whatever. But like that's a whole different beast at that point. Like yeah. that's a corporate run thing. Like that's a you know like i kind of consider that separate like if you've gone to your local friendly game store and actually ran a game what who's written i i helped write and make fallout equestria and i don't think there is a single game i've done that is rules as written either because i've forgotten rules and didn't write like just came up with stuff on the fly or um because the, the rules we had didn't fit and I'm the game dev for that mm -hmm. game, or one of the game devs. I mean, Zen is our lead game designer, so. Guy like, Gags I'm house ruled his own devs. game. Just saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I mean, um, Moon, our lead writer, he does a weekly game. Uh, he still does that, doesn't he, Zen? Uh, with Fee. Yeah, he still does a weekly game. Yeah, so he does the weekly, he does a weekly game. He runs a Fallout Equestria with a, a YouTuber partner of ours. Um, and like GM's her weekly session, she live streams, and he for the longest time was making up advanced combat rules because he forgot we had advanced combat rules, <laughs> and was just coming up with uh with a he just like homebrewed his own like grapple and pin rules, and then when we're like, why are you doing that? Like we have grapple and pin rules, he went. Oh yeah, that's right. And I looked them up. <laughs> and what beats the mess out of me, L9, is I ran a game. I was doing running games for him for the whole year before I even met you. That's all he did. <laughs> right. <laughs> he would liver blow gazelle punch till the cows came home. I I can't re I can't really stand I can't really stand on ceremony when it comes to the, when it comes to that kind of thing. Given the given the notorious level of house ruling I would run during during the brief bit of time where I was where I was running rifts where I had so I had so many house rules I may as well have put it in its in a book in and of itself yeah um, shut up and the but the but um now when it comes to it's funny that I'm it's funny that I mentioned that ha that hacked ass version of a of a monster girl RPG from that I found on TG because you are also using a per, a um, percentile system and also a D, also a separate D10 system. Um, that is correct. Now, I I did I um I was not a, I was not able to to dig to dig too deeply into um, Fallout Equestria. So. The question, the question that I have to ask is: Is the is that percentile system a carryover from your previous work, or is is it a is it a new thing specifically for, the, for this system? It is technically a carryover. Uh, I'll explain as such. So for Fallout Questra, it's a it's a roll under system. Mm -hmm. So one hundreds are bad, ones are good. Yeah. Now, when I was originally making uh, the Angel Astoria, I tried to incorporate that again, and it sort of worked but it you know didn't kind of, it didn't really uh so i had to flip it back to its original form which is 100s are good and you know ones are bad um if i can interject yes is, um, i know originally when we we're talking about it like we wanted to step away a little bit from like the rule set for fallout equestria we didn't want dames to just feel like a version 2.0 slash reskin yeah that, i was getting oh. that actually oh yeah sorry and um so like we came up with the the exploding die system and then realized it didn't really work very well for combat. And so for combat we implemented a D100 system which you know through playtesting we've yeah. changed and edited and updated and 
Yeah, flipped yeah. it to a rollover system because, mm -hmm. as I'm saying, it didn't um, work too great. Yeah, no. Yeah, neither of them worked too great on my own, but together, I think they worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is is that what pro is that what prompted the the um die pool system that you that you guys have? Yes, because originally we had it more like our Fallout Questra, which is basically just Fallout. Uh, you know, uh, special one to ten, but you roll under for to get your you know desired score. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but it just wasn't working out at like we wanted to, and it kind of wanted to break off a bit anyway. So once we got the D10 system uh, going on, because there was one core underlining uh, code I wanted to do for dames, and that was do not use a D20 system. Uh, yeah. This is not Dungeons and Dragons with Monster Girls. This is Dames of Astoria. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how I, it eventually evolved into this. And uh, like, a, and I believe in if it works and it works well. I don't care what you know anyone says, you know, because we got some comments on people using uh on us using two types of role systems, saying it's confusing or whatever. But if it works, it works. Yeah. As far as as far as the whole as far as the whole two types thing, um, the I I find I find it I find it endlessly amu I find it endlessly amusing that um that pe that people make that people would make that kind of argument. And maybe maybe I'm biased because I, because I have somehow lucked my way into be into being a bit of a historian when it comes to RPGs. But for one, um, a lot of a lot of early R a lot of early attempts with RPGs did use multiple types of of die systems. It's not ex I wouldn't exactly call it a a widespread commonplace thing nowadays. But it's not a, it's not as rare as pe as people think. Um, if you, if I need to use a case in point of of doing two different types of die systems, um, I would refer to the two d twenty system, um, because even though you're using roll under d twenty for that, you are using these you are using a d six based approach when it comes to when it comes to damage. Mm -hmm. Um. The, there's all there's also the fact that. Since you brought up the D twenty system, I'll use that. I'll use that in a case in the sense that even though it's called D twenty system, you're not you're not rolling just D twenties. You're rolling all you're rolling all almost all the dice. The rarest, of course, being the D twelve, which is forever alone. But the but the fact of the matter is the this is. A, when I think of a game that's a pure that's a pure one system die approach, I'm thinking of stuff like Shadowrun or or World of Darkness or um Ro or Rollmaster or um, basic <laughs> role playing. You know where all roads lead to this one particular die type. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, talking about multiple die, you were forgetting D uh uh D and D three point five's infamous D sixty four. <laughs> um, um which is a typo i'm aware of yes uh, uh <laughs> but rules is written <laughs> it's a t64 roll it <laughs> i am not i do not allow anyone to roll non-euclidean dice at my table and they are and non-euclidean dice are banned from the temple <laughs> but Listen, we have we have technology <laughs> and yeah, yeah, there was the there was wizards talking about a D thirty system, but everybody knew that was meant to be a joke. Um, but when, but the fun the funny thing is, is that with unless I'm mistaken, even with the two die types that you have, you're still rolling under. Ah, are you dames? talking about for uh, dames? Yeah, um, for uh, no. and uh, no, uh. No, we're not. We chose to flip it because now we're rolling over again. Oh, yeah. yeah, everything's a rollover. All but right. For every, oh, okay. I was like, mm, pause. All right, so everything is a rollover mm -hmm. in combat. When out of combat, that's when we use the dice pool system, and that's more of a either meeting or greater. So yeah, yeah. It's it's technically it's, yes, it's a rollover. Yeah, it's still a rollover. Yeah. But 
So it's st it there's still a there's still a degree of consistency with that, and mm -hmm. um the idea of the idea of rolling of having separate mechanics for com for combat and out of combat again that's not ex that's not exactly as out as out there as as some people think. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and like if you if you actually play it like the combat's much faster if you just yeah. do yeah. one hundred. It's just faster. Yeah. And I mean, the one thing I do want to kind of like say is, well, well, Zen was talking about how like you know, people were commenting on that two system, and we're just mm -hmm. like, you know, it, the one thing I do want to bring up is that like the reason, like we're not like ignoring people's feedback because we're, um, you know, going screw you, uh, our game is better this way. Um, and I mean, if we end, if someone ends up, you know, while we're playtesting and making this game, suggesting a better system that's more, um that is significantly better across the board to unify the two we'll like good chance we'll, we'll switch to it but it was through play testing and through feedback that we ended up developing this dual system mm -hmm. um so it's not like we just picked dice out of our ass and went yeah we're just gonna we're just gonna roll these two dice to make things extra complicated no we we have the system we were wanting to do and then because of feedback we changed it so that gameplay was better and faster and more streamlined without losing the the amount of complexity and um you know uh crunch that we hope the game like that we want the game to have uh, just kind of like how we we developed our uh our race creation system mm -hmm. um um, so, like, currently it's the best balance we have found of what we are hoping to achieve and what players consider fun. Um, which is kind of why, like, until, until such a point in time where our playtesters, uh, you know, tell us otherwise, uh, when yeah. people are like, oh, you're doing this and that's dumb, and we're like, yeah, no. Um, it's it's because we we have done the research, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the research says that you are wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, so I, uh, yeah, I do, I do want to say that like it that it isn't just a we're being conceited game devs. Um, as much as we are conceited game devs. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you you guys are Dead Tree Studios, not Wizards of the Coast. Hey, it just works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, Todd Howard. Uh, oh, God damn it! Who let the mop in here? <laughs> <laughs> but now, when now, I think now I think it's now, given the fact that you it, with um followed Equestria were um taking cues with the special system, I don't think it's out of line for me to say that that was a fairly um classless approach. Yes, and we sort of kept that approach, but it's uh, was we we evolved it for the system, would, uh, for Dames. Um, would it be fair of me to say that da that character creation in Dames is more of a archetype than a than a ar archetype based than a full fr rather than a full freeform approach? Uh, a it's, little. It is more. It's more towards the archetype. I would say. Yeah, it's, it's not completely because of how we. Uh, set it up as mm -hmm. um, yeah so to, for example uh in fallout question is you know it's just you pick perks and you basically make your class as you're going along you know evolving essentially mm -hmm. and dames we only go to levels one through ten and you don't you choose like technically you choose a class at the beginning uh but it's not like in D D where that's all you can do for tell you get the next level you can multi-class or keep going into your own class right mm -hmm. uh that slowly drips you your class's full capabilities right uh in dames you get a set number of abilities that the class that you chose or in this case where we call them the uh, disciplines you you gain those as soon as you get your your discipline mm -hmm. and as you continue leveling up you are building your character uh, through either traits or whatever bonuses you get at level up mm -hmm. yeah. until you get to Yo. your next discipline. Yeah. And in, in, those, in between those two disciplines, you could have started out a mage, right? And But for your next discipline, you could have chose assassin, right? 
but and you continue going on there if you put enough skill points in your right uh in, in your right skills that are needed to unlock a discipline you can go from mage to assassin to templar or whatever or i guess priest and then and then templar at the end um and yeah. and then that that is, and if you get to level 10 that is yep your character so that's why i say it's more of an archetype because you made that archetype to be what you wanted instead of us laying out a direct path for you all right yeah now speaking of disciplines i have um i have two i have two questions on that the first is um and i'm and obviously i'm not i'm not going to ask you to go through all of them but give me a sampling of of some of the available disciplines and what some of their analogs might be from um, from other, from other um, setups. Oh, oh boy! Oh boy! Give me a quick second to pull up. And while he's pulling up the the actual list, the the base four that everyone has is warrior, mage, uh, acolyte, which is the healer class, and uh, rogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, our our standard. You know. Yeah. So I got it up. Um, so the base, so we've just got a very small selection for like early level stuff mm -hmm. and then um, a whole bunch of planned stuff uh, that hasn't been started yet. So yeah, like, like Zen was saying, um, like your first early level stuff that like you can just get are like warrior, mage, rogue, acolyte, base healer stuff. But you know, then the, like if you're going warrior and you want to go straight warrior, like you can, you can get into like the berserker, which you know, um, barbarian rage type stuff, or a gladiator, or if you want to put points into like magic casting and arcane, you can become a, a spell sword and uh, be a magic swordsman, um, mm -hmm. casting spells and swinging swords. Um, you know, smith, champion, juggernaut, weapon master, sentinel, and like mage has got kind of the same thing where like mage, wizard, necromancer, mystic knight. Uh, bag mage because everyone wants to carry everything um, for all those kleptomaniacs. Um, but I mean, if you if you go full bag mage like that end level is like full on space time magic. It's great. Yeah. Um, you know, artificer, elementalist, runesmith, sage, sorcerer. You know, etc. Uh, etc. Et Rogues, assassins, poisoners, rangers, jesters, diplomats, ninjas, scouts, knife mm -hmm. fighters, uh, sharpshooters. Thiefs, duelists, bards, uh, you know, and then like with acolytes, we got stuff like well, acolyte clerics and paladins and inquisitors, um, because obviously no one expects the Astorian Inquisition. Um, shamans, champions, pacifists, druids, zealots, witch doctors, oracles, healers, blood mages, monks, astromancers, etc., mm -hmm. etc., and what you have available to you is going to depend on what points you put into what skills, which mm -hmm. you're free to put any points into any skills you want, no matter the, the discipline you choose. And some of them will require, and some, some of the higher, a lot of the higher level, um, and even like the, the, the secondary level uh, disciplines will require previous disciplines for you to have. Um, but like, you can kind of think of it as a branching tree system. So that's like, I, that's actually what that's actually what I was visualizing as you described it. The kind of thing that came to mind was more was more akin to the class trees that you see in a lot of um yeah a lot of a lot of a lot of um skir a lot of skirmish style console RPGs. Whether it be say ogre battle, Final Fantasy Tactics, um, Fire Emblem, Disgaea, that that kind of thing. Yeah, and. And yeah, exactly. It's it's a lot like that. And there could be some like high level mage stuff that absolutely requires you to have spent time specking into acolyte, or high level warrior stuff that requires you to have been a mage. Like you know, there's that or mage stuff that requires warrior stuff. Like mm -hmm. we're gonna have a muscle wizard for sure, um, <laughs> and that's gonna require you to spend the first couple disciplines in warrior stuff because mm -hmm. obviously the muscle mage is a warrior and a mage. Yeah. Um. You know, he casts fist, or she, it'd be she. Uh, she casts fist, uh, <laughs> and then everyone dies. Um, so, it, yeah, there's going to be a lot of. We're, we're going to try and have some interconnectivity without it being like super overly complicated. But the t the important things are going to be what points you spell on uh, spend on your skills, because many because uh, the biggest block 
the biggest um, requirement for a lot of these disciplines are going to be your skill levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like spell sword requires you to have five points in warrior skills and three points in magic casting spell uh, skills. So if you don't put any in your magic casting, um, you're not going to be able to do spell sword because uh, you don't have the basis in magic to to learn how to cast magic and swing a sword. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and like I mean, paladin requires you to have enough points in like great weapons handling um uh, because if you can't swing your sword uh and wield your shield you're not really going to be much of a paladin um uh but yeah so, so branching branching tree system to, to offer really cool uh open access build your own class system without mm -hmm. being too convoluted is why I call them dis disciplines and style classes. Yeah. Makes it makes sense. Now, because of because of the way you've described skills, um, this le this leads into something that I wanted to ask. That's ki that's kind of kind of been accepted as a bit of a mainstay because of how many um, games use this particular setup. A lot of times, when you're dealing with games that have some sort of skill system, you have some form of a attribute and skill dynamic whether it be, whether it be attribute plus skill is the amount is the amount of stuff you roll or your or your primary modifier or um go or going with in the in the case of warhammer the skill level just just makes it so that your the attribute they have to roll is some de is some degree of 10 higher than what it normally would be um are you going pure? Are you going purely skill based, or do you guys have a attribute skill um, dynamic with with a lot of the setup? Our attributes and skills are separate, and they're only it, they are never in tandem unless said uh, unless you use like by like a, a special a role or something or yeah. yeah like let's say you needed it to uh, climb a wall right it's a simple mm -hmm. easy right let's say okay you need. A body check and a flag check. Our flag is a skill, body is our uh, stat or attribute. Mm -hmm. And you'll have them roll those in tandem, but never adding them together. All right, that that definitely makes that definitely makes sense. Um, now a lot of games have a extra effort type of si type of system. Um, examples of this kind of thing can include Moxie from Eclipse Phase. Edge from Shadowrun, um, will willpower from World of Darkness, Fortune from from Warhammer Fantasy, um, hero points from from Mutants and Masterminds, and um, Bennies from Sa from Savage Worlds. Does Dames have something to that extent? We have that through uh, either perks, traits, abilities. That's how we give like an extra like role essentially mm -hmm. yeah. uh, through our things. Uh, but normally, if you don't take any of those, the only thing you have to, I guess, rely on would be your luck. Um, your luck is a part of our attributes or stats, however you want to call it. And we that doesn't like minus enough, and you can't sacrifice it to get any new roles. We just say, hey, if you want to, you know, have something happen or you need something like found. You know, a GM could usually just say, "Okay, roll up," mm -hmm. and if it fails, it fails. If it passes, you, you probably get it or something like that. But in the most part, all those extra efforts is nothing. We we don't have it because we feel that uh, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. There, um, I mean, there are a lot of like ability and perk ideas that we're still going to steal from Fallout Equestria because there were some really good ideas that'll fit in this uh, game. Um, but, like, you'll get like, you'll you'll get, like, depending on your your trait or your discipline, like, you'll you'll get things like Lucky from um, you know, D&D &D or whatever. Like, you'll, you'll get similar stuff where you can retry or you'll just get a straight-up bonus to these rolls uh, because you're uh, a gladiator 
Or you're a monk, and so monks just get a base plus three on advanced combat actions. Um, because obviously they do. Um, you know, so, like, there will be stuff like that. Um, uh, but, yeah, ultimately a, uh, oh, I don't really like that role, so as a base, I want to put in extra effort or, you know, spend a fate point or whatever. It's not really a thing we're, we're planning on using. Oh, all right. I, I can certainly get that. Now, um, since you since you brought up magic, this is this is an opportunity for me to count to count my blessings in advance that you guys are not using um, the D twenty system because then you because then you'd have to deal with whether or not you're using the Vancian model. And um, I've made it clear in vi in videos and interviews in the, that I've done over the years, I um, do not care for that system. At most, I tolerate it the same way you tolerate family during Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. So with that, with that in mind, when it comes to your guys' approach to magic, I'm assuming that it is skill-based for one. But two, is there a li is there some sort of limited resource pool that play that um plays into account with your with your system of magic? Yes, uh, we do in fact use a resource pool of mana. Mm -hmm. for our magic system. Uh, primarily for the reasons of, uh, as you said, I do not like the D20 spell system, like, at all. Like, I have played... Spell slots suck. I, I just, yeah. So I, I do not like spell slots. Like, I feel the whole system of that is uh, better used as... How do I explain it? Used for abilities. It sounds like a. Me personally, I just feel like it'll be useful for like if you're writing a book, right? Yeah. You you have they send those spells a day, but if you're playing the game, every time I play a wizard, I always like thinking like, all right, so I have no combat power. Uh, my GM can either have between one of the free combat sessions, and I need to determine if I want to use my one level two spell slot for this day, or for this fight. And hope that nothing else comes to mess me up for the rest of the day. That I actually need to spell. And I always felt that that was a bit limiting. So I scrapped that. I will never use that in any of our games. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the, the resource mana pool uh, makes it so that people can genuinely feel like spellcasters. And it regenerates, uh, like I guess you would, you know, in like a, a video game, it would regenerate. Uh, but it's. A slow regeneration. So let's say we have a uh, 30 MP. You mm -hmm. cast one spell that uses 5 MP. Uh, to get a that that mana back, you will have to rest. But not like uh, in you know D and D where the short rest and long rest is up to you know, your GM. Uh, it goes by a bit of tiers, mm -hmm. uh, where light rest would be. You're just not fighting, but you can like walk in or something, and your mana will regenerate around, let's say, because I don't have it in front of me, uh, two MP an hour. It's mm -hmm. always an hour. Or if you're asleep, it's four MP an hour, right? So that way, it takes off that GM's pressure of, and the pressure from the players to say, hey, like, should we, while we're in this dungeon, should we take a, a short rest? And and you, they might be like surrounded by enemies, but they need that they, they need that rest to get their uh, spells or like hit points back or hit die, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, so this way it allows it to just keep going naturally. Like you guys spent five hours in this uh, dungeon, boom, you got two, four, two, six, eight. You got ten MP back. You know, and now you can use two more spells. Mm -hmm. You know, that's stuff like that. So it just makes it. Uh, or use like a lower two MP spell five times. Yeah. Or use the one ten MP spell once, yeah. or whatever it is you want to do. Um. Well, having to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to spe when it comes to spells, um. Is it a, is it a case where where spells are um are fi are fire and for, are fire and forget or are or um do the, and this is especially prevalent 
this is especially prevalent, I'd imagine, with the casting classes. Are there uh, are there options to customize the to customize the effects of spells, and is it and are you guys using a codified spell list in the book? We are using I a codified guess, spell list. Yeah. So, um, since I wrote most of it, I can probably help answer a lot of that question. So, oh no, go lot... ahead. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, fuck you too, Zen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of the spells are, are going to be kind of, you know, like, I mean, especially like wood, magic missile or whatever. Like, that's just a shoot it and and forget it, you know, mm -hmm. kind of deal. Roll to hit, whatever. There are going to be some spells that have a little bit more of a longer lasting effect. Um, uh, you know, like, uh we'll say arcane mark which you know allows you to just put like a magical mark upon a thing mm -hmm. and so it's just got a magic sigil that depending on what you want can only be visible to you or only visible to certain types of people or whatever um or like i mean there's a lot of stuff you can do with like illusion magic mm -hmm. um man i love i love grand illusion um <laughs> <laughs> make the world your own um so there are let me see uh currently we've got of uh, 10 spell schools and we're averaging between 20 and 30 spells per spell school mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of stuff you can do just base rule stuff um and for like if you want to change like what what kind of changes are you hoping to do to a spell um, like, are you just trying to say that, like, your fireball hits the person and, you know, completely immolates them? Or, um, uh, you know, are you trying to say, like, um, I want this ice javelin to be fire instead? Um, you know, like, what, what kind of changes are you, uh, are you inquiring about, I guess? Um, what I'm, ma what I'm mainly inqui- what I'm mainly inquiring about... And this is the reason why I specifically brought up the um, casting classes is that there's two, there's two avenues that I that I see fairly often when it comes to, uh, when it comes to customizing spells. And I do, and before I get into that, I do need to clarify what I meant by fire and forget. What I mean by that is that ace is that the is that when you cast a given spell, it's going to have the that specific that specific effect. Um, always 100% of the time if somebody casts fireball in D&D &D, it is always going to go off like fireball no ch no changes um typically it's a um, lot of spells. now two now two avenues that two avenues that I've that I've often seen one of them is some is some sort of meta magic ruling and I can use and I and with some games that use um talent systems I've seen it where um meta magic is its own ca is its own category of talents um or you ha or you have the possibility of um, overcasting, like the basic effect, and then additional effects you can tack on to the spell by spending more MP than you normally would have to. Oh, so, currently rules wise, we don't really have any customizations like that. Any customizations you want to make would just be descript like flavor text wise. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, my light javelin uh has a crackling electric glow to it you know whatever yeah. um or you know my turn undead makes them explode into sunlight instead of making them collapse into ash um but in terms of like overcasting we would uh, a lot of that's going to depend on uh what different disciplines we write because that's more that's more going to be a discipline based uh ability mm -hmm. um uh you know uh dual casting's a thing i know followed equestria we had um which is again one of my favorite types of magic um and it was and i'm pulling a blank uh zen help me uh illusion. not illusion not, 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 not manipulate not the not the magic school the actual mechanic for multicasting matrix casting matrix casting yeah we had matrix casting so you could essentially cast multiple spells together and blend them into a solid effect um so i want to do uh thunder uh you know uh 
fireball with electric zap. And I'm going to spend the, the extra time and the extra mana to cast these two spells simultaneously and fuse them together. And now instead of a fireball, I have an electric ball that also deals a little bit of burn damage. Mm-hmm. Um, so... And we transfer that over, more or less. Yeah, we're transferring that over, because I love matrix casting. Um, yeah, but I, most I, of our I'm, spells are, as you said, fire and forget. Yeah, they're fire and forget. Um, and... Uh, there will be a couple different type of overcasting abilities, like spend more mana, get more damage. I think we mm-hmm. actually already have a couple of stuff like that. Um, or um, you can now add elemental damage to uh, spells that don't have elemental damage, or increase the amount of elemental damage they do. Um, so there are abil- there are going to be abilities that do that kind of stuff, um, but not it's not going to be like a base mechanic. Um, and I will say that despite the fact that we do not have the uh, meta magics from you know uh, D and D that or the equivalents, I believe that we have uh, enough spells and enough freedom to use those spells that it wouldn't even matter. Yeah. Yeah. No. But, like I said, it's like 250, 300 spells just out the mm-hmm. gate. And. What, and because of that, one of the one of the things I'm curious about is the me- is the method of spell um, learning. Um, I've seen I've seen some instances where um, where each t- each tier of spell casting is its is its own talent or its own, or its own feature or what have you. Like get this and you can and you can learn um, you can learn first tier, second tier, and what what have you. But you but you have to actually find the scrolls during adventuring. Um, some have it that leveling some you have the case of leveling in a skill gets you a certain number of um, of spells that you have a- that you have access to some do it straight by XP spending um, what approach are you guys using oh it's a little bit of a mix um, like yeah starting out like uh, classes give uh, the easiest way to get it is just to pick up a discipline that gives you spells mm-hmm. um, and a lot of magic casting related most magic casting related um, disciplines will just give you an extra just you get to pick up and learn for free immediately plus three spells or versatility amount of spells or whatever the amount is for that specific discipline and then uh, we have you get more spells from your skill because uh, you get skill you get uh oh sorry once we have skills at certain points in the skill which is only from one to ten mind you uh at free seven and uh, ten you get a perk for free yeah. like you don't have to worry about it and it's a perk related to that skill so for arcane you say hey you now have access to advanced skill uh, advanced yeah. spells extra spells master spells and you get like a spell from that and yeah. the third is you get a spell from a talent and then fourth, you can get spell just from learning it. <laughs> yeah, you can just learn it. You can just go and find someone who's a better magic caster than you uh, to teach you magic or learn it from a book or a scroll or whatever. Um, and also, additionally, too, like one of the things that that is a hard set rule is if you know you're doing character creation, level one character creation, and you decide you want to pick up the master rank spell, um, uh. I don't know. Let's say the expert base spell remove curse because we're doing a curse campaign. And I mean your your spell casting ability is only two right now. Mm-hmm. You can still pick that up as a spell you innately know. You just can't cast it until you level up and unlock expert perks. Or expert spell casting. So once you level up your uh you, you pick it up at um you know character creation and congratulations, it's just a spell that you'll know or that you you have the the innate ability to know. You just can't cast it until you level up your arcane, you know, spellcasting skill to seven and unlock advance. And then the moment that you do that, congratulations, you can cast that spell um, without having to spend, uh, get a new discipline to pick up new spells or learn it from someone because it's a spell you quote unquote already know. Um. And that and that's being the thing... said, there's also you can uh, like just scale dump into your uh, arcane skill to get all master. Yeah. Uh, though I guess not get all, but to unlock master rank spells. But you're like level three, and your mm-hmm. mana sucks ass, so you can only cast it once per battle. 
<laughs> Which I mean, hey, if you want to do it, you want to do it. Um, if you want to do it, you want to do it. Yeah. You know. Last cannon all the way. <laughs> now, um, now, um, I will, I will, I will admit that when I was looking through some of the when I was looking through some of the book titles for Fallout Equestria, the one that the one that got me a bit of a chuckle is the expansion that you put that you put in to expand the uh, martial end end of things. And hoofty cuffs. Yeah, hoofty cuffs. And that that brings that brings me to a question because this is because this is this is a common trap that a lot of fantasy games fall into is what is do you, is when it comes to the ta when it comes to the um advantage the advantages talents and and whatnot for more martial characters are they still going to have a the, a decent variety of of actions, so that all the interesting <laughs> stuff isn't relegated to the spellcaster. If I seem uh, if I seem biased on this kind of thing, it comes no from worries. it comes from years of my um, t time with the basic attack only f only meat stick fighters from my early days. All right, so look, look, want me to take this out now? You can if you want. Um, we like fighters. We like martial artists. Uh, all right, so. When you use the well for Hoofty Cuffs, let's start there. So in the Hoofty Cuffs, that's basically our martial arts expansion for those who don't know. And and how it works in the Fallout Question system is it's a series of six perks and one like train perk. That but that's not here nor there. So as you are leveling up you can choose this martial art as take it as a trait first or learn it through a master. And you get it. And then as you, you go through the levels you can pick it and like you gain this grand abilities right mm -hmm. uh, however they are all in service to the to the rules and the equipment list and perk list before them so they're an improvement because uh, in Fallout Questure our first game system we have advanced combat actions which are things like a, like a buck which does like a, basically a drop kick mm -hmm. uh, drop kick pins Flying tackles, uh, grapplings, yeah, and stuff like that. That's always just in the game. No one needs no skills to learn it. They just have it, and that's an option you can attempt. You're not going to be good at it, but you can attempt it. Mm -hmm. Now, when we came over to Dames, we incorporated that same philosophy. So if a fighter wanted to, like, just choke slam somebody, they can, because... Choking if... and slamming are both... Advanced combat actions you can do. You can just do it. It doesn't matter if your an arm is one or ten. You know, if you are missing all your arms, doesn't matter. You, you're able to attempt it or some equivalent of it. And we kept that with it. And going back to Fallout Questia, since they are, uh, we love fighters. Everything is in service to that. So these abilities are basically just like. Uh, they're the they're the movie version. They're the, they're the lone samurai like way to play. You you slice up and you're able to sunder like a whole wall just for your slashes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, iron hoof which is like iron body. Uh, you're just tanky like all over like R E D T your D R which is another thing we transferred over. Uh, damage threshold and damage resistance. Mm -hmm. And in place of A C. Yeah. Uh, and you you're just taking you're taking hits from all sides or just not massive damage because you're just that like unkillable and yeah. some other like Mimi ones like uh, Shadow Stand we have for our, our bat ponies right <laughs> which is basically you some <laughs> you, you, you have a living sh you have a living shadow and you put your magic into that shadow and you summon it and we call it Black Sabbath. And you can use it to do various abilities. Technically, it's not a martial art. It's more like you a motherfuckers put a really. motherfucking JoJo reference in it, didn't you? Oh, oh absolutely <laughs> not. JoJo, what's that? Yeah, we, we don't know anything about JoJo's. <laughs> Call, calling Which it Black one are you Sabbath. talking about? Jotaro. <laughs> oh, oh, fuck off. Jolie. JoJo. Jorno. Josuke. Which one? <laughs> calling it calling it Black Sabbath among a metalhead. What do you, do you think you're that? Do you think you're that fucking slick? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> but, the but, but that, that's that's the kind of stuff we did for uh, Fallout Question. <laughs> yeah, and I'm and um that yeah. uh, so you you got a lot of passive and 
active abilities and boosts just based off of what martial art you you know, like um dirt nap which is my favorite is all based off of like chokes and that mm -hmm. and so you don't you don't get like a whole lot of extra this that but you get bonuses at the wazoo for advanced combat actions so pins mm -hmm. slams chokes trips like you just become untouchable because no everyone's just on the ground doing the funky chicken yeah um uh or like you know um reading the wind which again you're untouchable but that's just because it's all about increasing your dodge um uh so uh you, depending on what you specialize in you get a whole whack of different um, passive abilities or active in some cases now if you don't mind me picking your brain a little a little bit when it comes to certain mar when it comes to certain martial builds if so if somebody if somebody wanted to do the a more a more um fen a more fencing type of bit of build um what kind what kind of things would they probably end up taking where the sword um so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh it, it goes a bit deeper than that like just if you just wanted to like if you could if you just wanted to make a base character you didn't know what else to do and you just take hey if I wanted to make fans character, I would tell you, okay, take where the sword. Mm -hmm. However, if you are a veteran of the Fallout Questioner community, uh, it goes a bit deeper than that because we have like a myriad of races. That's like they're basically your class at first, anyway. Mm -hmm. Then you gotta go for all the our <clears throat> two thousand five hundred perks, <laughs> perks and traits combined. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and then after you have then chosen your uh, final card, then you gotta choose all your equipment that you use to optimize your damage and or AP potential. And then at the end, uh, look to your DM and have him cry. Look, and look, my DM, or, my DM already does that whenever, whenever I, br whenever I break out one, whenever I break out one of the, um, one of my multi-class builds where I'm go, where I'm going, um, um, um. What we call Palerer, i.e., Sorcerer Paladin. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good way, it's a good way for the DM to curse to curse my name every time. But when it but when it comes to 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 go to another um, build example, if if suppose some suppose somebody wanted to do a a. Um, a martial artist, but instead, instead of doing generic martial artists, they wanted to specifically lean more towards, for example, um, some a something a little more more Thai influence. Oh, um, yes, we have a specific martial art from Muay Thai. Um, <laughs> uh, in follow the question, at least, mm -hmm. uh, if I can remember what it's called. But yes, you want to be a, you want to be a. <laughs> Muay Thai fight, uh, Muay Thai fighter. Uh, here, let me find it for you. Uh, do 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 do. Uh, I'll dude. also like to say that even though they, I for that example I just put that you just munchkin yourself, a <laughs> uh, pencil from the gods, you will probably still die from radiation poisoning because in your in your quest to become the one true swordsman, you forgot that radiation still kills you. Yes. Um, hoofy cuffs. Unless you're a ghoul. In this case, you probably stepped on the landmine and died. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me look at. Uh, so, uh, tactical backpack is what we called it. Um, but yeah, that is quite literally just a Muay Thai ripoff. Um, it is an entire martial art based off of doing Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's all crippling damage. Um. So it's all about breaking people's limbs, um, and wearing sharp, pointy armor to mm -hmm. just accentuate that. Yeah. Um, increase your crip chance. Um, you get uh, a special ability called el elbow slash knee strike, and it does crippling damage. Uh, flying tackles ca uh, costs less action points. Um, your climbing uh, action point cost is reduced to ten. You get a flying knee attack. Um, your attacks do armor piercing damage now. You, you gain extra DR uh, to shrug off damage. Uh, your uh, crippling and armor piercing damage is now upgraded a rank. Like, mm -hmm. lots of fun. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of, speaking of that, 
Um, now you you've talked about how you talked about what what counts as it, what counts as a critical and what counts as a botch. Now, in combat, what kind of what kind of effects do critical ha do criticals have? Is it a case where it's just incre a chance to increase damage, or is it a case where you have where you have a full on um um w wound system? In uh, I'll take this one. So, uh, um, this is referring to Dame's Last Story. Mm -hmm. So, in Dame's Last Story, once you have a critical success, uh, we based it. Uh, I took the knowledge I, I I gained from Fallout Question, of course, and modified it. So instead of like we used to have double damage on crits, and mm -hmm. just that, because uh, everything else that came from that became uh, crippled. That was like a secondary effect. It wasn't really a cause of the crit. It was just something happened because you did enough damage to a specific area, right? Mm -hmm. So for dames, we needed to incorporate a new system because they run, you know, at base level just differently. So for crits for dames at Astoria, if you get a critical success on one of your attack rolls, I decided that instead of just double damage, and which hurt a lot, yeah, which would hurt a lot. Uh, thought I'll like TPK a boss sometimes. It, yeah, it, it it was insane. So to change that up, I decided to use a, just a standard D20 for damage, right? Cause uh, sorry, I didn't explain our damage system. Uh, it goes by uh different, you know, the dice systems, the D4, mm -hmm. six, eight, ten, yeah, whatever. And the only one that uses a twenty is the critical successes. Yeah. So that way you can get like a just a bonus damage of one or twenty, yada yada yada. Yeah. Uh, but that's because our HP is so low. Mm -hmm. uh, now, oh. if you take a certain number of uh, damage in the attack, you'll get a wound. And these wounds are the equivalent of the crippled limb system we have for Fallout Question. Mm -hmm. uh, which will just <laughs> uh, halt your ability. Uh, where a few uh, minus to your attributes, uh, movement speed, just a myriad of things that's happening to you right now. Things like a broken nose, which you know reduces smell-based perception, or um, a broken arm, which means the arm is now considered a cripple. You can't wield weapons in it or use it for skills. Congratulations, you have one less arm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so and, stuff that has like been that. that has been uh, noted. One less arm. <laughs> one less arm. Well, some people are like eight arms. <laughs> I. I would be I would be remi I would be remiss if I did if I didn't mention the tagline that um that I, that the against the dark master d devs tr tried to try to see if they could get catch catch on called make criticals hurt again <laughs> um because because whenever it comes to this kind of thing I'm always reminded of the more of the infamous critical hit tables that role master has mm -hmm. which um. If you ever want a good laugh, just look at the just look at the ta pages and pages of critical hit tables in that in that particular game. But when it but would it be fair of me to say that in something like da when something like dames, um, there's a certain degree of squishiness when it comes to characters. Definitely, uh, our damage uh, is. Enough to take out a character in about two to three, three to four hits. You know what I'm saying? Three to four hits. Yeah, yeah, three to four hits, or like two to three if you crit once or twice. Yeah, but I'll explain oh. why it's like that. So in in the event to spite uh, Dungeons and Dragons AC system, because a lot of things I just did not want to take over, and one of those was AC. Uh. Once again, you're in good company. <laughs> See, I, I, the idea of buying a full play of armor, and if I get hit, I'll take full damage, as opposed to if I was wearing nothing, just because the score, you know, was, I don't even know how much full play gives you, like plus five? Yeah, and pen, and penalties to skill checks and speed. Yeah, just because of, the, of that. And he rolled a 19, which he could roll any other time. Like it doesn't matter what you was wearing at that time. He could just hit you. Mm -hmm. uh, that that rubbed me the wrong way. So I decided to uh, modify it a bit. And so instead of AC, I made a DC for a dodge chance. 
and I brought over some uh, a mechanic from Fallout Equestria, which is the the armor or damage threshold. Mm -hmm. DT. Yep, for DT. So, say we now have a full plate armor, which has like 40 DT. You block 40 damage just straight out. Like if you if someone does 50 damage to you, if you have 40 in armor, bam! If they get through that dodge chance, of course. Yeah. You get hit. So congratulations, you only take 10 damage. Boom, bam, good. So that means you keep fighting, you can fight longer. Mm -hmm. But you are obviously uh, uh, st are still going to die eventually. But it actually feels like you buying that armor made a difference, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In that regard, what, I'm, guessing that's, I'm guessing that because of that level of squishiness, that's why in the combat system you have multiple opportunities to mitigate it, it sounds like? Yes, uh, that's and it's why our healing is fairly open. It's why our armors are uh, fairly defensive, like actually defensive. Mm -hmm. It's why we have a dodge chance on top of that. It's why it, it's why we have a lot of things. So even though you only have let's even the weakest per character, I guess I think it has like thirty is the the lowest we can go out of one. The mm -hmm. HP. I want to say yeah. Yes, yeah. and you can die. Like, not just from, like, the a one weapon attack itself, because we also have an AP system, right? Yeah. Which allows you to do multiple attacks, uh, multiple attacks a turn. If you want to. Yeah. If you want to. It, or move, whatever. You you do it for anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we don't start it off uh, with your full AP bar, right? Because uh, the max AP in our game is 12. But at level 1, all you can use is free. And at level two, it goes to four, level five, level five, level three, five, and it keeps going up and up until mm -hmm. you get to that max level. So by the time you get to that point, no one's throwing the 64, <laughs> eight trigrams, 68 palms at you, sorry, 64 palms, mm -hmm. at level one, and just turning you into pace. So I, it's squishy, but you have the danger of an actual adventure. But it gives you enough ways out of it that you won't feel otherwise well, i'm hoping if you want you, a tank you, you, you can be feel. a tank mm -hmm. yeah you want to take a tank, but i'm hoping yeah you know what i'm saying you, you hopefully it doesn't like make you feel uh what's the word uh, ostracized uh in the combat mm -hmm. now dean dean yeah combat's supposed mm -hmm. to be scary for a comp a bunch of different reasons and i mean also a lot of what it went into that decision is like Fallout Quest just rocket tag. It's a lot of big numbers. Big health pool. Big mana pool. Big AP pool. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've seen some crazy assholes do like a thousand plus damage um, in uh, a single turn uh, using their entire full AP bar. And um, like a really heavy hitting attack is like, you know, like endgame type damage. You're looking around, you know, 80 to 100 uh damage um but yeah like combat combat was thrilling but not necessarily dangerous feeling depending on what your gm threw at you because mm -hmm. it was rocket tech and we just I, I i i want we wanted combat and dames to just be like D and D 1e and 2e terrifying <laughs> <laughs> but also fun yes but also fun <laughs> I can I can certainly get that. Now, I do want to I do want to take the time to congratulate you guys on how well the Indiegogo did, since you guys ended up getting two and a half times over what you initially asked for. Yes, we had all the hope in the world that it wasn't going to fail. <laughs> and did and it managed to it managed to do managed to do pretty damn well. Now, obvi obviously. Certain real-world events ha have have made have caused some slowdowns, but and I know you ha I know you do have the thing up for pre-order on your on your site, but when it comes to either a or either some sort of early access version or 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 something like that that's going to be open to the public, what do you see a release window for something like that? Playtest. Whether whether it be whether it be in a um oh whether it be an open to the public playtest or some or some sort of early access version or even the full even the full release, um. 
what do you what do you see as far as a release window in that regard? So, um, uh, the one thing with like playtesting stuff is we kind of sold that as a tack on to our Indiegogo for certain tiers. Mm -hmm. um, not that we're regretting that. Um, so it's gonna mostly be closed playtests uh, for a while, um, with the exception of conventions. Um, you know, because we run games at conventions all the time, and that was some of the earliest playtesting we've been doing. Um, freaking as far as, like, I want to say three years ago. Um, four years ago. Something crazy like that we've been doing playtesting on this game. It's actually, uh, uh, 2017, I think, is when we started playtesting. Um... That so was bare, bare bones. yeah, that was like we were trying to figure out rule systems and just the base skeleton wireframe mesh of the game, um, pulling pulling weird bullshit from other games that were like, "This is congratulations, this is a character. It has feats and abilities from six different games." But th ignore all of that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so like, um, but uh. So I, I can't really say that there's going to be any form of open playtesting between now and uh, release for just public public playtest. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from going to conventions, because we will definitely, the moment conventions open up and we can go to conventions in person or even online, like um, we're hoping to go to Gen Con. Um, and even if we're not going to Gen Con physically, we're still going to run games through Gen Con online. Um, though I'd like to go to Gen Con, uh, physically, um, in September. So, aside from that kind of stuff, you, uh, you'd probably be hard-pressed to, uh, don't, don't hold your breath for public playtesting. Um, you know, private stuff, like, I mean, you know, if, if you want to simp for our game, I will more than happily sit down and run you and some friends, um, uh, some play tests uh, mm -hmm. because I am I am more than I am I am not above uh, whoring out my GMing to get people to fall in love with the game who have a platform and are willing to sit for it. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> because uh, the best uh, because the best thing I can do is to make people fall in love with this game, um, even if they don't have a platform and they just want to gush about it. Um, so. That you're you're not really gonna look at anytime soon. Uh, the actual game itself is slotted for release in August 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit over a, a year and a half, a little under a year and a half. Um, and that's the 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 game date that we've been planning since we launched our Indiegogo. We are still relatively on track for that. Um, a lot of it just comes down to like managing our time and getting together uh like oh i got a whole list of stuff that still needs to get like written and then like all of us need to sit down and read through it and tear it apart and say how much it sucks and then rewrite it three times um but like i mean we're on version 0.93 of the game and mm -hmm. the biggest things we're looking at is fleshing out some lists and um finishing up character advancement character advancement is going to be the longest one yeah um that and keeping feature creep at bay <laughs> um but yeah so we're hoping to have like version 1.0 almost the final version of the game done December ish mm -hmm. and then i spend the rest of the time just formatting um and making sure art gets done. Uh, so yeah, August 2022 is about what you'd be looking for in a very convoluted, uh, yeah, to, to kind of shorten things up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not opposed to like running a private game for you and some friends if you want. All right, I do I do I'll certainly consider that, and I do appre I do appreciate the offer. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I'd call if I'd call my if I'd call it um, simping in my case, but the oh, the I'm offer's just, appreciated. It's better than joke. Um, <laughs> if I run a game for you, you're not obligated to simp for the game. 
No. Listen, all all pairs are kings. <laughs> I am uh, not. I am not following up on that. I know that that fruit is hanging. That fruit is hanging so low that games. All... He's a. <laughs> God damn it! But with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. And it sounds like you guys have plenty of insanity as it is without my help. <laughs> our uh, our motto is uh, eccentricity in gaming, and that's just because the proper words aren't PC enough to go on our business cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss Astoria f further on or just the shit post, the door is always open. Yeah, man. If you want us back on, just like let us know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you mind, can I take a small moment to show some people real quick? Go right ahead. So, if you guys are interested in a Monster Girl lore that's uh more Kenko Cross, we have a sponsorship with a Monster Review Girl. She's one of our homies. If you enjoy Danes by Story and music, we have a music artist called Dirtus. Check him out on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. And also check out our own YouTube channel where you can get some good Danes by Story lore for this upcoming Monster Go game. Mm -hmm. Or mostly just watch us um, live stream games and shit post um, because we're terrible at the whole social media thing, and that's the only way we're able to get frequent use on our YouTube. Um, because releases for things like animations and music and and lore videos takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. especially when we're focusing on making the game. And well, like like I said, the like I said, um, as the door is the door is consistently open around here, and as I've as I've often said, um, drinking is not mandatory here, but it is encouraged. I mean, if you Cheers. want to have the two of us on to gush about Dame's lore, um, I mean, it's gonna be your funeral because we'll just never shut up. Um, but we'll. I'm down. Zen, are you down? Listen, listen. I'll invite yes. myself <laughs> onto his show. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> like, no, I, I must hold you back. So I guess I'll come. <laughs> oh. All right, congratulations. Uh, you've just uh, officially had us invite ourselves on your show to talk about lore. Yeah, it's not the first time. Uh, uh, but with but with that with that said, of course, I do I do also want to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>